Değerli meslektaşlarım, sevgili katılımcılar, her yıl 12 Mayıs'ta tüm dünya hemşireleri hemşireler günü kutlaması için bir araya geliyor. Ancak Covid-19 pandemisi nedeniyle geçen yıl olduğu gibi bu yılda hemşireler günümüzü kutlama değil, toplumumuza nitelikli ve güvenli hemşirelik hizmeti sunmadaki engellerimizi, sorunlarımızı, çözüm önerilerimizi ve taleplerimizi dile getirmeye devam edeceğiz. Sağlık sisteminin yükü omuzlarına yüklenen ve daha fazlası talep edilen biz hemşireler, kendi ve ailemizin yaşamlarını riske atarak yaşamın kutsal ve değerli olduğu bilinciyle toplumun sağlığı için mücadeleye devam ediyoruz. Tüm meslektaşlarıma sonsuz şükranlarımı sunuyorum. Hayatını kaybeden meslektaşlarımızı ve acılı ailelerine saygıyla anıyorum. Bu yıl Uluslararası Hemşireler Konseyi, Hemşireler Günü'nün temasını Hemşireler Geleceğin Sağlık Bakımı için öncü bir ses olarak belirledi ve hemşireleri geleceğe sağlık sisteminin liderlerinden biri olarak gösterdi. Bugün online olarak 3 gün sürecek etkinliğimizi Sayın Anette Kennedy'nin konferansı ile başlatıyoruz. Teşekkür ederiz Kennedy. Sizlere Sayın Kennedy'nin kısa bir öz geçmişini sunmak istiyorum. Kennedy 1949 yılından beri Türk Hemşireler Derneği'nin üyesi olduğu ve yakın işbirliği yaptığı Uluslararası Hemşireler Konseyi'nin 2017 yılından beri 28. başkanlığını yürütmekte. Sayın Kennedy 2017-2019 yılları arasında Dünya Sağlık Örgütü Bulaşıcı Olmayan Hastalıklar Bağımsız Yüksek Komisyonu üyeliğini yapmış olup Nursing Now Hemşirelik Şimdi Kampanyası Yönetim Kurulu üyesidir. Kennedy Bakanlık tarafından 2018-2021 yılları için İrlanda Sağlık Hizmeti Strateji Slate Care'ın Uygulama Danışma Komitesi'nde görevlendirilmiştir. Daha sonra önce Avrupa İmçeler Federasyonu Başkanı olarak görev yapmış ve Avrupa Parlamentosu, Komisyon ve Konseyi'nde aktif olarak karar alma süreçlerini etkileme yönelik çalışmalar yapmıştır. Hemşirelik lisans derecesine sahip bir hemşire ebe olup kamu sektörü analizinde yüksek lisans eğitimini tamamlamıştır. Ayrıca İrlanda Kraliyet Cerrahlar Koleji'nde onusal üyeliği bulunmaktadır. Sayın Kennedy 19 yıl boyunca İrlandalı Hemşireler ve Ebeler Örgütü'nün mesleki girişim direktörlüğünü yapmış ve aynı örgüt bünyesinde başarılı faaliyetler yürüten eğitim, araştırma ve kaynak merkezini kurmuştur. Değerli katılımcılar, sorularınızı canlı ekran üstünde yer alan soru sor butonundan yazabilirsiniz. Buyurun Sayın Kennedy, sizi dinlemek için heyecanla bekliyoruz. Do I go ahead? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, President Sleek. And thank you. It sounded like a very long introduction. So I thank you for that. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. I've had so many um, very good memories of visiting Turkey. And my last visit was to Istanbul. And I went to see the Florence Nightingale Museum, which was very, very interesting. And one day I will go back to Istanbul. But I've spent some time on holidays in South Turkey. So yes, a beautiful country and beautiful people. So thank you. Um, I'm speaking about leadership during the pandemic and lessons learned. So if you'll just give me a second and I'll share my screen with you. Okay, I just want to say a little bit about um, ICN, the International Council of Nurses first. For those of you who don't know, the organization. It's a federation of more than 130 national nurses associations throughout the world. It's the voice of 27 million nurses worldwide. It is one of the oldest and largest nursing organizations in the world, founded in 1899 by um, three very visionary women, one from um, the United Kingdom, one from America, and one from um, Germany. And then it was um, uh, one or two more women that came from New Zealand and Australia. And it was the first um, non-governmental organization that was recognized by the World Health Organization. And we've remained very close in working with WHO. It is the widest um, reaching international organization for health professionals. 
and it's basically it's the voice of nursing. We look after and champion the contribution of images of nurses worldwide and um, you've seen the how the image of nurses has progressed during this pandemic over 20 and 2021. Um, we advocate for nurses at all levels, always trying to advance the profession, always trying to bring nurses in to advance nursing practice and specialist nursing practice, always looking to ensure that nurses can work to their full competency. And of course, it's always about influencing health, social, economic and educational policy, because at the end of the day, the nurses are the closest to the patients and they know more about the patients than anybody else. I don't know what's happening to my screens, but anyway, don't worry. Um, and as you can see, the orange indicates where we are in the world. Um, quite far reaching and all of us, even in the last um, year or two, um, three, four more organizations have joined us. As you know, the, the year 2020 was designated by the World Health Organization as the year of the nurse and the midwife. And we had so many plans. Every country had plans, every region had plans and the ICU, IC, ICN had plans to celebrate and to showcase nursing. But that changed with COVID. Everything changed, the whole world changed. And what happened um, was that we ended up with nurses having to face a pandemic with um, lack of protective clothing, lack of education, and we went into it with a shortage of nurses. Consequently, what happened was that we had quite a number of infections and quite a number of deaths among our nurses. The actual number, we have no idea because only some countries collect fairly accurate data and many countries collect data on healthcare worker infection as opposed to nurse infection, doctor infection and other worker infection who are giving a service to the health service. As of the 31st of March, we um, collected information from 60 countries that showed that 3,100 nurses have died. We know that between six and 10% of infections are among healthcare workers. And we estimate that to be between one and two million people in healthcare, in the healthcare workforce. Um, and that's an awful lot of people that will have, many will have post COVID infection. And as you know very well, better than I do, the contributing factors with the lack of uh, PPE, insufficient confection and control and prevention, lack of training, lack of compliance, and lack of resources and lack of um, sufficient number of nurses. Um, there is underreporting of the number of infections. And unless we have good data on the number of infections within healthcare workers, it's hard to track how the infection is proceeding between healthcare workers, between healthcare workers and patients, between patients and healthcare workers, between visitors and healthcare workers, between communities and healthcare workers. And we need that data in order to prevent infections in the future. As you can see from the circle, the highest rate of infections and deaths are among the, in the Americas. You may have heard and you may know about the State of the World's Nursing Report, which was launched in April 2020. It was the first ever report brought out by the World Health Organization on nursing. There has been three reports on the state of midwifery, but not on nursing. It was um, 191 countries submitted to that report and it was supported by information from our National Nurses Association, which made it much more accurate. It's not perfect, but it's the most accurate information we have. It's a good, good report and it, its recommendations broadly are about the need for investment, the need for investment in building capacity in the workforce, the need for investment in education, the need for more um, colleges of education, the need to support advanced practice, the need for regulation, and the need to have nurses in leadership roles and in policy. Those are the main um, recommendations. Tied to that is, of course, everything to do with quality, everything to do with gender, and to address um, the best 
um, situations to in, that will enable uh, women to work in the health service. And we have seen um, during COVID the difficulties for women um, when many of the uh, work areas have been closed down, like crash facilities, like schools, and how do they manage both um, to maintain uh, looking after children, looking after older people and go to work. That was a main major issue. Also as violence was a major issue. Um, as I said, we went into this crisis uh, with 6 million nurses short throughout the world. The main shortage is in, of course, the lower and middle income countries. But however, there's a shortage in every country throughout the world. Our report in ICN has stated that 4 million, between 4 and 4.7 million nurses, um, mainly in Europe and North America, will retire within the next 10 years. That will make 10 million nurses that we will be short. Added to that, our research from our National Nurses Association indicate that nurses, because of burnout, because of stress, because of physical and mental trauma, many have said that they will leave the profession early. We worry that perhaps up to 3 million will leave. We are extremely concerned that we could be looking at half the current workforce being short in the next few years, unless there is action by governments, both to retain nurses and to invest in building capacity. On the right hand side, you see a report, it's called Aging Well. And it, this was brought out by ICN in conjunction with CGFNS. And it's to do with policies that will try to retain um, older people in the workforce, because they cannot always be working uh, in the clinical area. They cannot all, they are going to have issues to do with their own health. So we need um, situations and we need incentives to keep our older professional nurses in the workforce. We need their knowledge base. We need them to be able to mentor younger nurses and we need to be able to give them flexible working conditions and conditions that will retain them. That is so important. And the reason that I'm, I'm showing you this is that at some time um, you will have to use some of these reports. They're good reports, they're short reports, they're succinct and they're to the point. We have done many surveys throughout the 2020 and now into 2021 with our National Nurses Associations and they have been very um, good at coming back with information. In fact, we've probably had a better relationship with all our family of nurses associations throughout the world during this COVID and in this pandemic than we've ever had before. We've constant communication with them. We have constant webinars. We're constantly um, feeding back information to them and feeding their information to the global agencies like the World Health Organization, the UN, the G20, the G7, and many, many governments. Here you will see from left to right, um, going clockwise, uh, the circle shows you, we're talking about the economic well-being, mental health of nurses, infections and deaths, the vulnerability, um, the need for protection and the vulnerability, there has been a lot of incidents of violence. And I'm only going to pick out two or three because otherwise I'm going to run out of time. Um, in many of the countries, um, compensation is not available to um, nurses who are out sick. And there's always a dispute about whether the nurses became sick in the health service, in the hospitals, in the community, or did they get the infection from somewhere else? And um, there is always a dispute about wanting to compensate them. Um, a lot, in a lot of countries, it's not COVID-19 is not recognized as an occupational health disease. We're constantly fighting for that to be called as an occupational health disease. And of course it should be, and it may become a chronic illness for many, many nurses. Um, mental health is a huge issue and it will be from all we've been hearing from our nurses, from the letters we've been receiving about, you know, the uh, experiences they have had, particularly in seeing um, older people die or people that they have had to uh, be with when their relatives can't be with. 
that's going to have a long lasting effect on them. And I worry about the future. And when they see, when they have time to reflect, as one nurse said, what will we see in the mirror? Will we be able to put, um, will we be able to recognize our thoughts and feelings and be able to put some words to how we will feel when we look in the mirror? Um, I bring this up because at, the, at various times you're going to have to want to lobby your employers, your policymakers, your governments at some stage, and you need to be able to um, share the, the information in the reports. And all you have to do is really read the um, recommendations, the very good recommendations. Uh, as I said, the State of the World's Nursing Report, um, the World Health Organization brought out a charter on patient safety, but it's really about um, ensuring that you have health workers safety because health workers safety and patient safety go together, two sides of the same coin. If you keep health workers safe, you'll keep patients safe. The two, the executive board meeting and the World Health Assembly, which comes up uh, end of May, June, we constantly make interventions in relation to um, nursing, in relation to health service, in relation to nurse migration and all of those. And we will be doing that uh, in this June coming. And we will also be bringing um, a policy direction, a strategic direction for nursing and midwifery 2021 to 2024, based on the State of the World's nursing report, the recommendations on that. And we hope or we will have to support um, and ensure that governments ratify that strategic direction so that then we can call them to account. And it is all about investing. It's all about building capacity. It's all about education. It's all about you know, ensuring that governments recognize that um, nurses are uh, the backbone of the service and we need to invest in them. And it's always a case of lobbying. It's called it's a case of hard work. Nothing comes easy. We have to keep constantly, constantly lobbying. This I have put up because you have seen, I'm sure, over the last year and a half um, that ICN has been invited to speak on many, many of the media channels. And it's a way of getting the nurse's voice. It's the first time ever that nurses have been asked to give an opinion on um, the state of health, on the state of nursing, on, the, on what's happening. And it's been all the big channel, media channels. And we've tried to um, put the nurse's voice across in relation to the shortage of PPs, the shortage of resources, the need for a priority with vaccination, not just in, uh, in any of the high income countries, but right across the world. And the need for continuous um, testing and infection control and prevention. And we do a lot of social media, we do a lot of print media, we do a lot of, um, it's, it's continuously. These are just, and I'm not going to um, spend a lot of time on them, um, fact sheets. The reason that I'm showing you the, these is that we're bringing out fact sheets so that's quick information for anybody that needs um, to support a case they're making. And as you can see, one is on infection and death rates, another is in fact on the shortage and retention of nurses, and another one is on stress, burnout, and nursing profession. And it gives you, this is information that we've got from our in a National Nurse Associations worldwide. It's up to the minute information. It's um, accurate, uh, you know, as accurate as you can get that kind of information without, you know, in, in depth uh, research. But it is, it's good information and it's, well worth having for uh, your own resources. Um, COVID-19 vaccinations, as you know, um, there has been all sorts of disputes about the vaccination, the different vaccines, um, what countries are getting them, how many are being vaccinating in the high income countries can afford it and the low income countries not um, getting equity of vaccinations. And we're constantly called for the um, vaccines to be distributed to the people that are providing the health service, particularly the nurses and the healthcare workers that are facing this pandemic on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, 
but so far it's been slow in low and middle income countries and as you see there's a constant constant um lobbying by the um who by the um european commission and by many many other agencies to lobby um governments to share um vaccines and we, we can see what's happening in india right now and it could happen to any country and they need their their health workers need priority of vaccination there in order to be able to look after their uh, people and it is so difficult what they're facing right now global health priorities and the reason that i show you this is that um as you know irrespective of the pandemic things have to continue and you know yourselves that uh, healthcare doesn't stop um, just because uh, the priority is given to COVID-19 uh, pandemic, it's still, you're talking about the sustainable development goals, you're talking about universal health care, you're talking about humanitarian disasters, you're talking about the UN Commission on Human Resources for Health, um, we're talking about patient-centred care, we're talking about public health and health risks, and we're talking about mater uh, maternal and child mortality. And those global priorities and ICN's health and nursing policy priorities are the same. We work towards the same objectives at the end of the day and the same policy direction. And we work on many of, many of the committees that um, work on those at global level. In the very early stages of COVID-19, ICN collected information from our NNAs and we developed a 12 point call to action a call to action that our national nurses associations could use when there were lobbying governments. And the reason that I put it up here now is that it's still as relevant today as it was in March 2020. And it's all about um, ensuring uh, the safety and the protection of health workers by ensuring that they have resources, PPEs, because in many countries still they don't have sufficient PPEs, that they have training. We found that it was um, sporadic. Um, that they have uh, protection and occupational health, that they have um, comprehensive uh, systems to track and trace. And we're constantly lobbying for that, as I said, for data um, to uh, investigate the um, healthcare worker infection, financial compensation for nurses, um, that there's regulation. And this was an issue that came up several times because young nurses have been brought in before they um, were qualified to help in um, dealing with the pandemic. And also older nurses were being brought back. People were being moved from one area to another to support so that their specialties were changing. And that was making nurses very um, unsure. And it was, it was demoralizing in some ways because they weren't getting the support and they weren't getting the supervision or the help that they needed. Um, the other thing that was really concerning was that although um, nurses were probably delivering um, most of the care, so we delivered 90% of the hands-on care, were delivering um, all of the um, organization and planning and management of um, the COVID pandemic in relation to um, opening up more beds, teaching nurses in, in relation to intensive care and teaching um, teams of doctors in actually pronation of patients and teaching um, them how to communicate with patients' relatives. There was all of these kind of things and opening up hospitals, emergency hospitals, but it was nurses that were doing all of those, but they weren't involved in the task force or they weren't involved in the strategic planning. And that was that is the real issue. Although we were the implementers, but we were never the, um, um, designers are the strategic uh, people that were acting uh, in relation to the decisions. We were never the decision makers and we were rarely seen in, in media either, um, task force media briefings, and that has to change. This was the um, independent panel brought out two reports. The third report will be out on the 12th on Inter International Nurses Day and the final report will be for the um, World Health assembly in June. 
we spoke to them. We told them about the issues um, in relation to um, the nurses' experience during the pandemic and what should never happen again. And these are some of the um, recommendations that they had, the initial recommendations they had, and the um, comments they made uh, was, which I use all the time, the world was not prepared and it must do better. And the world was not prepared. Billions of pounds have been put into um, curbing the pandemic and trying to save economies because they, as you know, most countries almost closed down with the pandemic in order to save lives, in order to protect people from illness, in order to have an economy. But had they put some money into the um, health service to build strong, resilient health service, we wouldn't have this problem. This is what I talked about, the strategic direction for nursing and midwifery. Um, and this is the policy that we've given to the World Health Assembly for ratification. And if that's ratified, I urge every um, nurse in every country to call their governments to account. It's about education, it's about jobs, it's about practice, it's about leadership. And the evidence is there that we need um, appropriate levels of education. We need quality education, we need competencies and we need graduates and we need the data to support that. We know that we have a shortage. We know that we have maldistribution of um, nurses throughout the world. 80% uh, of the shortage is in lower middle income countries. We know we have migration, um, particularly from the countries that need the nurses most and retention is going to be a big issue in the future. Um, we need to have regulation uh, around the scope of practice and we need to stop the restrictions in allowing nurses to work to their full competency. Um, and we need to look at the gender bias and have equity between um, women and men. Um, two for you, um, government chief nurses, and we need to um, change that. Anywhere we have picked up the fact that there are government chief nurses, many of them are not at a level that they're involved in policy um, and um, strategy in relation to the health service itself or they're not on the same um, level as the chief medical officer. These are some of the, we pick up so many case histories and as you know, we'll be bringing out the International Nurses Day resource guide in, um, on the 12th on, on um, International Nurses Day, which shows um, the initiatives that nurses are taking, constantly, constantly taking initiatives to um, ensure that uh, people get the health they need. So as you see up on top, it's exercise down on the left, it's um, a nurse giving information to um, patients through the media. And on the right, it's uh, a nurse in Hong Kong dealing with stroke patients and um, an advanced practitioner who is diagnosing prescribing. Nursing leadership for the world's nurses. Uh, we need, badly we need education. Um, in relation to leadership. And the ICN brings out, um, has Global Nursing Leadership Institute where they um, educate around 30 nurses every year. Um, it's supported by Burdett Trust and it's all the most senior nurses. And many of them have gone on into executive uh, positions following the um, program. And we have now, um, Com uh, combined with Sayın the Kennedy, Sayın Kennedy, Kennedy, uh, five minutes, two minutes. Sorry, yeah, I'll be I'll, two seconds. Okay, okay. Um, I've said before that um, we need chief nursing officers. And Nurses A Voice to Lead is the um, International Nurses Day resource guide we're bringing out a vision for future healthcare. And um, just to say that the um, International Council of Nurses Congress is the 2nd to the 4th of November, 2021. Um, and just to leave you with a comment that I um, think is so important uh, for all nurses. Um, you know the little um, girl, the 16-year-old girl, Gret Thurnberg, 
um, who is the climate activist. And her comment is, you are never too small to make a difference. And I believe that all of us nurses, we're never too small to make a difference, but together we can make a huge difference. In fact, if we work together, we can change the world. Thank you very much for listening. Biz teşekkür ederiz Sayın Kedi'ye. Süremizi biraz açtık. O nedenle sorulara geçemeyeceğim. Ama meslektaşlarımızdan sunum için teşekkürlerini sunuyorlar. Şunu da görmüş olduk aslında. Dünyadaki hemşelik durumunun ve pandemi sürecinde hemşirelerin yaşadıklarının bizim ülkemizde benzer olduğunu, yalnız olmadığımızı söyleyebilirim. Çok teşekkür ediyorum. Ağzınıza sağlık.